Well, hello, Russell. Welcome to the show. I'm so, so happy and honored that you're here. It's great to be here. It really is. I'm, I'm really happy um, also because, um, because I know that you not only have you had your, your own fertility struggle, but you can speak from a male perspective on this. So I'm re- I, that's another reason why I was really excited. And so I would love to just go ahead and dive in. Mm. Um, today we're going to be talking about your mind and your fertility, but I would love to dive in. And if you could share with us a little bit about um, your journey. Um, yeah, your sure. Um, first thing, my wife was diagnosed with fertility struggles when she was a teenager. And when we got married, we thought having children maybe not uh, be an option for us. And we thought we were okay with that. Then my wife decided to try and heal herself more naturally or, or manage her condition more naturally. And she never believed she'd get to a stage where she'd get her full fertility back. But we thankfully found a wonderful kind of uh, more holistic gynecologist. And she did a more holistic kind of way of looking after herself and, and then yeah after eight years of her journey healing journey she got her full cycle back and having children was a possibility for us and after about a year or so of trying and by that point you know you can you become experts on this journey we knew yes. exactly that yeah we knew what we we're doing and everything else but after that almost a year of trying we knew that oh, we knew something else was wrong mm-hmm. um so that i had my first test i'd never been tested up to that point and it was disastrous across the board um yeah, and it felt like a kick in the teeth. We felt we'd kind of done the eight-year journey, you know, but wow. then we found out I was going to pretty much infertile. And so I went through a four-month program to improve my fertility, doing all sorts of things I firmly believe can make a difference and all sorts of things I use in my life for different things today, like acupuncture, herbs, like lifestyle, nutrition, all sorts of things. And after four months of doing all that, um, my test was always, it got slightly worse. <laughs> the doctors didn't believe it'd get any worse, but it got slightly worse. At that point, I gave up thinking, okay, there's nothing I can do about this. Mm-hmm. We're in the hands of the clinic. The clinic were exploring maybe ICSI could be an option for us. But at that point, I realized there's nothing I can do to improve my fertility at this point, so I kind of stopped trying. And having our own children looked kind of pretty doubtful at that point. And it was interesting that, you know, I wasn't aware of personal development or anything kind of back then. Um, I kind of set, it sent me into kind of mini, not, not a kind of, kind of crisis, but I started to question kind of where does happiness come from? Because I wasn't aware subconsciously all my life up to that point, I'd be living my life, I'll be happy when. It was yeah. always the next thing. Yeah. And we started as a child, I'll be happy when my mum's happy with me. I'll be happy when I, you know, one of my, I've got the good grades Get at school. the accomplishment. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And pleasing other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next thing, I'll be happy when we have children. Clearly, yeah. it wasn't happening. I thought, well, where does happiness come from? At the same time, my wife turned around and said, she didn't feel united on the journey. And I was really shocked, thinking, well, I come to all the appointments, we talk about things. She said, yeah, but I, tell me what you think about things. I don't know how you feel about it. I have no idea what's going on in here. You know, share how you feel about things. And this has come up once or twice in our, kind of, in our relationship before, but it really kind of, I guess I really heard it in a different way at that point, mm-hmm. thinking this, this, is, this is not good. Um, and it was a combination of all that. I suddenly realized I lived in my head. Um, I, you can't think and feel at the same time. So a lot of thinking going on that stopped me feeling. And it probably started from childhood, it stopped me feeling painful stuff from childhood maybe. But I realized it wasn't really serving me. And this all this overthinking, what, thinking what people think about me, all that kind of stuff. It was preventing for me from being happy. It was preventing me from being truly connected to my wife. And long and short of it was I, I took myself onto a silent retreat. I'd never done anything like that before in my life. A meditation retreat? Well, just a, just a, just a, it was, it was unled. It was just me. I said, oh. I actually went to a convent, interestingly, lived with a bunch of nuns for a week just to be on myself away from job away from the internet away from phone away from all that kind of distraction of life so i could just be and just see what came up and just sit with the reality of the situation and it was interesting how yeah a lot of emotions a lot of stuff came up but it was quite a spiritual awakening where it's the first time i recognized i was living my life i'll be happy when it's mm-hmm. the first time i recognized i wasn't truly ha- happy in life and all the things I thought would make you happy, the good job, the good career, the lovely wife, the house, the car, et cetera, et cetera. But I wasn't really content and I wasn't really happy at work. It wasn't really me. It was a good job, well-paid job, but it wasn't really me. And I've been realizing I've yeah, been a people pleaser. I've been living my life under people's expectations mm-hmm. rather than truly being me. I wasn't free to express my emotions because I was scared of these things called emotions and what to do with them, all that kind of stuff. 
But during this time, and once I, for the first time, accepted where I was at in life and accepted it and knowing that it's okay doesn't mean I can't change. And during that kind of yes, spiritual awakening in many ways, having children shifted from being a need to being a desire. Mm-hmm. I suddenly realized life felt like a quite empty to me. But when I left that place, it felt more like a blank canvas rather than being empty. It felt like a, I could go away from this place and start filling it with things like a job that inspires me and, and start doing things that fulfill me. And that may or may not involve children, but I hoped it did. I still want to continue the journey. But it shifted from being a need to actually being a desire. And I think it's a very mm-hmm. fine line. When I went along and short of it, I left that place, I resigned from my job and changed this kind of whole mindset, got myself a coach and all sorts of things, got into personal development. Well, four months later, my wife got pregnant naturally. There's a one in a billion chance we're told it could happen naturally. I was amazed, I was intrigued, so I did another test and my, my fertility improved dramatically without me trying to improve it. And I can look back and see I fell into a more psychological, healthy state. Life began to flow again. Mm-hmm. And so it began to flow physically as well. So I firmly believe, we both believe, if we knew now what we knew then, it would not have been a 10-year journey. And that's why I love sharing my clients about, I call Project You versus Project Baby. The more we focus on Project You, Project Baby tends to take more care of itself. I have so many clients who put life on hold. And we, as we know, this journey becomes all-consuming. It feels like life is on hold. And I get them to un, un, unstick life, allow them to live life true from their soul again. Know to whatever happens, they're going to be okay. And life begins to flow again. And hey, presto, Project Baby tends to take more care of itself, whether naturally or, or with treatment. So it's a kind of long answer to your, to your question, but that's how I kind of, and that's how I got into this work as well, because I wasn't planning to specialize in this. I, I trained as a cognitive therapist as part of my journey to understand more about me in that, you know, having that awakening. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what to do with my life. And halfway through the course, oh, wow, this is what I do. I want to help others. Again, not specifically in fertility, just help others. And the gynecologist we work with, as soon as I was qualified, start, started referring patients to me. I suddenly realized, wow, this is a really magical space to work in because I can really relate to their, to their story. And touching on the male stuff, I, can, I think I can relate to what I love about this kind of journey is, you know, I wouldn't wish a 10 year infertility journey on anyone, but I'm really thankful for the things I learned on it about myself and life. I truly believe I'm a better parent now than I would have been if I hadn't gone through that kind of learning experience. I like to think I'm a better husband because I think I can relate to him in a far more real way. I think I can understand feelings more. I think I can stop trying to fix their problem and listen to, to where, the, where she's at. And all the things she really wanted me to do before my kind of awakening I hadn't really heard and now I really get, get it in many ways I'm not perfect don't get me wrong I'm not no, perfect. of course <laughs> I still make mistakes and I'm more aware of my mistakes I guess mm-hmm. and I love helping couples connect in a, in a deeper way on this journey because this as you know this journey can put the strain on the best of relationships so for me it's about really making that connection the, the best it can be um, because the research shows you know this this journey can put a strain on relationship and, and a strained relationship can impact fertility because it's mm-hmm. well, unfortunately become like a bit, of, a bit of a vicious circle. So again, I'm, I'm really thankful for some of the things I learned about where our experience comes from, the mind-body link and, and how we relate to male and female energy, all that kind of stuff. I'm really thankful that, you know, um, yeah, through that pain, they say, you know, they say our, at our greatest you know, pain can become our greatest gift. And I really believe that for people on this journey. So beautiful. You know, I, I got chill bumps during many, many of the points that you, that you talked about. And, you know, it's, I mean, so many things, the, the one in a billion chance that doctors had prescribed. And yet, you know, there's something, there's this, when we leave that space for the mystery, yeah, for That's something it, else to it, take over. Exactly. I think what it is, doctors are great at diagnosis but not very good at prognosis because no one can predict the future. You know, not even our thinking. Our thinking does a, try, a great job of trying to predict the future, our worry, our fear. It's all predicted future, but nothing can predict the future. And I think you're right. There's a mystery to this. You know, fertility is an art as well as a science. If it's mm-hmm. a pure science, we would be having this conversation. You know, it would be cracked by now. 
you just do the steps <laughs> like an equation and then you get a baby <laughs> but yeah. it, it doesn't work like that yeah. Yeah. and so i think that's why so many of so many of us feel tested during this because you know we all have grown up with this when then thinking this thinking that happiness is external happiness comes from the the job the wife the and then the 2.5 children mm. um and you know we can achieve most of that but you can't create a child no if no. if that's yeah if, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to have a child I mean, for me it's about knowing in one hand we're okay in this moment We've got everything we need in this moment. We're born complete. We're born yeah. fulfilled when we're present to this moment. It's our thinking that drags us away from this moment. We're resourced for this moment. We have everything we need to cope with whatever life throws up in this moment. We're designed to be in reality. So in one hand, it's knowing we're okay, we're complete and fulfilled in this moment. On the other hand, it's holding, holding our goal lightly. Let's have children, yeah. a new career, whatever it may be. It's holding it lightly. Now, we don't need it to be happy. And for me, it's a creative energy between the two. Mm. Forward. We're far more like to create those things from that space. You now, I work with women who have been very successful in many areas of their lives, whether it's career, business, relationship, mm. projects, or whatever. And they tend often have this striving mentality. They know what they want, they go for it, and they tend to get it. They work hard and, and they go for it and they get it. But I firmly believe they would achieve those things with far greater ease and well being without that sense of striving. Because yeah. no one performs their best when they're under pressure. No one. And that sense of striving doesn't tend to work for fertility because we can't control it in, in, in the same way we control other things in life. And also that striving tends to be counterproductive for fertility. It can actually make things more difficult because it puts our body in our intention. It can knock out hormones. There's all sorts of things within our system. So that striving mentality, which may have been successful in other areas of their life, doesn't necessarily work when it comes to fertility, but I also believe they would have created those things and greater things with greater ease and well-being with that balance of knowing we're okay and holding that goal lightly. And that allows us to have more of a creative mentality. Uh, uh, yeah, and you mentioned that during your story of when your, your need shifted to the desire it's yeah. still something that you want and that's okay. And I think, as you say, we are here to create, we're co-creators with the divine yeah. God, whatever you perceive, yeah. Yeah. but to know that we can, <laughs> it's not just, Oh, let, let me, you know, force it. It, it yeah. won't, it won't work that way. And yeah. so what I hear from your story and what you're saying is this kind of acceptance, acceptance of even the possibility that yeah. maybe it won't happen. But yeah, exactly that. And I think acceptance is a, a misunderstood term in this context of fertility because my wife remembers getting to a stage where, a stage where she didn't want to accept because she, she thought mm -hmm. acceptance meant giving up. Yeah. I mean, the woman never had a baby. She didn't want to be that woman. Yeah. And when I talk to my clients, it's the same thing. It's almost they believe acceptance is giving up. For me, acceptance is accepting you're okay in this moment. And yeah. that's where the okayness comes from. For me, success with the client is they know they're going to be okay, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. That's why if my clients have a very different experience, if they say they're having treatment, you know, I have clients have two, three, four rounds of IVF, we do work together, the next round, they have a whole different experience of mm -hmm. it because they know whatever happens, they're going to be okay. It doesn't put so much pressure on the whole process. So yeah, for me, it's that acceptance means you're okay in this moment and who knows what the future brings we don't need anything particular from the future because you're okay in this moment and accepting where you are today doesn't mean you're going to be there tomorrow it's just accepting where you are today yeah i i agree with you so much you know acceptance and and uh, surrender are two things that i think are you know surrender is coming up more and more but they're misunderstood in terms of it's either passivity you know people fall into that or people think that it, it just means giving up or, oh, I'll just, I won't do anything. And it, do, it yeah. doesn't work that way either. So you still continue, you still do the efforts, you still, you know, do coaching, um, you know, go to, if you're in through IVF, go through the, you know, that treatment, whatever you, you need to do, yeah. work on the physical body. That's right. But I think you take more inspired action rather than taking mm -hmm. fearful action. A fearful, must yeah. do everything in case I regret not doing everything. I regret missing, you know, regret not putting my hardest into it you take more inspired action that's, that's resonating with your soul your soul knows what's best for you yeah. and i mean lots of women who are doing their daily temperatures or whatever and i'm a big fan of that stuff but the moment it becomes a chore stop doing it because 
that fear, that, that sure, that negativity side is going to do more damage than the, the benefit of doing whatever it is. You know, my fear of not getting pregnant outweighed all the benefits, all the stuff I was doing. So the mindset, mm-hmm. I think, trumps all the things we kind of, we kind of do. And I think the biggest thing that stops people accepting is a misunderstanding of what creates our experience. Because they think they're feeling life or feeling their circumstances. So if they're feeling pain or, or, or stress or grief or sadness, our thinking says you're feeling X because of Y. So you're feeling sad because of this situation. Or you're feeling angry because this just happened. Mm-hmm. That's a misunderstanding of what's creating our experience. 100% of our experience comes from a thought in the moment. It's what we're thinking about our circumstances creates our experience, not the circumstances themselves. Mm-hmm. If we think our, our, our experience comes from the circumstances, our mind gets very busy about what we need to change that or to make the sure we get the we need so we can feel different. Mm-hmm. When we soon realize we can disconnect our human experience from our circumstances because we're feeling our thinking about it. We don't have to be scared of our experience. We can, as long as we know where mm-hmm. it comes from, and 100% of our experience comes from thought in the moment. And thought comes and it goes. Thought is, no, our, our, our feelings know nothing about our circumstances or who we are, our present or our future. It doesn't know any of that stuff. It's just thought in this moment. Mm-hmm. And thought comes and it goes. And the more we understand what's creating our experience, we don't have to be scared of it. And we can re-allow it. If we feel down or feel angry or feel fearful, we can allow it because we know where it's coming from. It's just thought. <coughs> and thought comes and thought goes. It can just move on. We, we tend to think, we need to do something to feel better. And we get to more and more busy. So we've got fearful thinking. We think it's due to this. We get busy about how we mm-hmm. fix that or change that. We're just adding more and more thinking into the mix. And that stops us being at peace. So for me, it's the biggest thing that stops people accepting or allowing what is, is a misunderstanding of what's creating our experience. So they're living life, I say, outside in, mm-hmm. so inside out. They think they're feeling their circumstance. And they think they're, think they're feeling their boss has just shouted at them. They think they're feeling they've just seen mm-hmm. a pregnant woman. Everything they experience comes from thought in the moment. Yeah. I mean, just as we talked about, you know, we are co-creators. Sometimes we fall into the other category of forgetting that we're creators. Oh, yeah, yeah. Creators of our experience. So instead of, you know, thinking that life happens at us, (laughs) to us, um, that life is happening for us. And Mm. we do have, as you say, we do have the ability to create what we make that Mm. mean. We don't have the ability to change the circumstances yeah. always. Sometimes yeah. we do, sometimes we yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, but we have the ability to change what we yeah, make yeah. mean. And, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm hearing you say. That's so, yeah, yeah. That's so important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I wanted to touch, at, touch on was um, you were talking about, you know, your biggest fear was not getting pregnant. And I would love if you could put yourself back there, what, what did you make that mean, that possibility of not getting pregnant? I think it's a story. There's a, while, while I was on this kind of retreat, I was sitting in these beautiful gardens and there were two vegetable patches. One was full of all these vegetables growing and one was completely empty, a few weeds. Wow. And I looked at these two vegetable patches and thought, that's my life. Everyone has their life full of stuff growing, not just having children, but they have the happiness they want, the career they want. They seem to get what they want with so much ease and well-being and happiness and joy than me. For me, my life is barren, it's empty, it feels like hard work, life doesn't seem fair to me. I'm the good one, I did, I did my homework and everything else, and, but life seems like a struggle to me, it just doesn't seem fair. I felt like a victim, basically, I had a kind of victim mindset. I was very angry with God, life, the divine, whatever. We called him God back then, but I was very angry with life back then. Well, sometime later, and I'd gone through my kind of, I guess, my version of Project U, I looked back at the same scene, and, and it was actually very similar. A lot of stuff growing, a lot of stuff empty. I looked at the empty virtual patch and thought, that's my life. I guess not full of things I want it to be, but it's a blank canvas. Mm-hmm. I can create, so I can feel more of a creator mindset. Rather than the victim, blaming God, life, the universe, I could be more of a creator and I can start filling it with stuff that inspires me. I can, I can start living the life that is true to my soul rather than the life that people expect of me. Yeah. I can start doing, and follow my bliss became my mantra. I started doing things just for the hell of it because I enjoyed it. It felt like play and I was really almost rediscovering the sense of play and who I was. Mm-hmm. So I think I just reframed it from being a victim to being a creator. And I guess 
I, 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 I quote uh, a very wise guy called Sidney Banks quite a lot. And one of my favorite quotes of Sidney Banks is, he said, there's, there's nothing out there that can harm you. There's nothing out there that's going to save you. Because mm. there's nothing out there. And it didn't mean that from a kind of atheist, there's nothing out there point of view. What he meant was, it's all in you. Yes. It's all in you. You know, I very rarely quote the Bible, but, but you know, God is within us, God within us. That's what it means. I believe that's what it means. We're made in the image of God. And we're not just a poor photocopy. We have that creative energy within us. You know, it's, everything's within us. So it was interesting having that kind of insight, that kind of realization, even the smallest of things like getting stuck in a traffic jam, I get really frustrated, I resist reality, get, well, oh, it shouldn't be like this, or get annoyed, or why, but what, what the consequences may be. But now I just see more, again, I'm not perfect all the time, but more often than not, I say, okay, can't change the circumstances, what can I create from it? Mm. More time in the car expected. I keep audio books in the car. I keep audio stuff in the car now. So it's time to flick onto that. Or from the fam in the car, we can play a game together. It's just starting to flip it on its head from being like a victim yeah. and getting angry or like to actually what can we create from this situation? Because you're right, we can't, we don't always choose our circumstances. We can choose our response from those circumstances. And the more we understand, the resource was just within us. Our well-being is within us. It doesn't matter if we're late for a meeting. It doesn't matter about this external stuff. Our emotional well-being is within us. We're always resourced. The devil never shows up in life when we're in it. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be late for meetings so I'm stuck in traffic. I can play all sorts of scenarios in my head. Exactly. That's la-la land. When I'm in it, when I show up, I can deal with it. I think, okay, I'll do this. I'll make that call, tell them this or whatever. Mm-hmm. We get on with it. We deal with it. We're resourced for reality, which means the future can take more care of itself. And we don't to, it allows us to be more present in a more playful, creative, joyous way. That makes sense. It does. You know, and I, I find I do this a lot, you know, when I'm, when I notice the, the reactivity, when I'm standing in a supermarket or something like that. I imagine, you know, all of the possibilities, I I do it in a different way where I just imagine possibilities like maybe this, maybe the person in front of me really needs this food or like maybe this person's having a bad day or maybe, you know, and just realizing that we're all in this together and seeing the connectedness. It's not just poor me, it's all of us. And when, when, when you take that bigger perspective, because when you're, I say, when you're standing next to the wall, you can just see the wall. But if you step back, you can see that we're all together and how can, Maybe I could smile at this person. Maybe yeah. I could, um, you know, laugh yeah. at my daughter or something else. Yeah. What exactly, as you say, what can I create yeah. now yeah. in this moment? And yeah. it doesn't have to mean all of these things no, no. that my mind wants it to mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's our habitual thinking. And it's actually our habitual thinking. And most of it started from childhood that stopped us doing that. The thing I would say is, it makes it about us. You know, our thinking makes everything about us. Our boss shouts at us and they think, and we think it's about us, or he's no good, doesn't think I'm any good, or he's not happy. With, maybe he just had an argument with his partner before he mm-hmm. came out of his office. Who yeah. knows? But see, our thinking makes it about us. But actually, when we're in that disconnects us from our true sense of self, our soul. It disconnects us from other people in that moment. It disconnects mm-hmm. us from that moment. And that's for me, true contentedness comes from connection. Connection to our true sense of self. Connection to other people in that moment. Connection to the moment. They're the moments we savor. They're the moments we're really enjoying when we just feel connected. When we feel connected, we're less on our mind. We just feel calm and present. Mm-hmm. It's our busy mind that thinks we need to do something, fix something, change something. There's that habit that disconnects us completely from our true sense of self, our resourcefulness, but also that moment. So I guess my job is to help people have less on their mind so they can be more present. Yeah, I that reminds me of this uh, study out of Harvard. I can't remember who the professor was. I didn't intend on quoting it, so I might butcher <laughs> it. <laughs> but uh, he did a study on happiness, and he had uh, a big sample size of, of people just text. They texted two things, the activity and whether they felt happy or not, yes or no. And um, w- through the, their interpretation, it, was, it didn't matter the activity. What mattered was, as you say, the presence. Yes. Whether they were present in that moment, they could yeah. have been riding on the subway or yeah. walking or whatever yeah. it was. But when they were present, they were more happy. Yeah, yeah. I, I know a, a, a coach I know does his year, yearly kind of 
workshops to make make 2017 the best year possible kind of thing does it begin the year and it gets the participants to review the previous year to make a list of all the things they're grateful from the previous year mm -hmm. so they make their list and it gets them to go down that list and identify which ones their goals were striving to achieve in that year which ones are most happy coincidences and he says consistently it's two to one towards happy coincidences because hmm. we're just present in it you know we're just we're in that state of flow we're in that state of flow we're just present we're content we're connected in that state of flow we're, we're on fire we could be at work and getting stuff done and it feels more effortless that's when we have less on our mind but we're more resourced which is interesting we're trying to manage our thinking so much what, what often I might ask a client if I've got a magic pill and I take if I give this magic pill, you'd never think again about it. <laughs> now, would you take it? And they say, Well, no. I'd like to think less or have less fearful thinking or less anxious thinking, but generally they think they need their thinking to be happy, to be wise, to make decisions. It's like a navigation tool to life. Mm -hmm. Then I ask them, okay, tell me the times you're most happiest. Tell me the times you're most contented. And they realise it's time they're less on their mind. Yeah. Tell me the times you're most you know, you can always come on, you know, resourceful and on fire, have less on their mind. Yeah. We're just being more present. We're being guided by our instinct, our intuition. It's a different energy. It's a different guidance mechanism. Yeah, my spiritual teacher says, you know, you can count your life on the moments when your breath is taken away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when moments, you know, orgasm or childbirth mm -hmm. or moments when you're climbing a, a mountain and suddenly there's a clearing and, and you just, yeah, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, you know, you're, it, you're taken aback by the beauty yeah. of that. And in yeah. those moments, there are no thoughts. No. And in those moments, there's nothing you've done to get into that state. We drop mm -hmm. into that state automatically. Yeah. We don't have to do 20 minutes of meditation to get into that state. We drop into that state of flow or, or connection. We just fall into it. Because actually, it's our default state. Mm -hmm. It may not be our habitual state, because we have habitual thinking that keeps us away from it. But as a human being, it's actually our default state. And if you look at toddlers, they're less contaminated by outside in thinking over the years. They're more our purest natural form of self. And yet they get upset. They get caught into their thinking. They can have a tantrum in the middle of the supermarket. But then to go back to being okay without any intervention because mm -hmm. it really is a self-correcting system. The less we interfere with it, the more it just self-corrects. We go back to being present and calm. But we have this habit of thinking to fix our thinking. We have a habit of thinking to fix our state. But of who mind. is saying we need to fix the thinking or control the mind? Is the, It's a thought. It's a thought, <laughs> I exactly. think less. <laughs> so it's the That's mind what, against the mind. The, yeah, it's exactly that. The initial thought is never the problem. It's our thinking about our thinking is the problem. It's our relationship. When, when you get think. caught in, you know... Um, yeah. Uh, like a, a jealous thought or an angry yeah. thought or and you I shouldn't be so angry at myself yeah. <laughs> and then that just makes angry. it worse exactly yeah <laughs> so people say well, how do I stop thinking you can't stop thinking if you don't need to stop thinking then when we recognize what it is it just settles itself but you're right it's our relationship with our thinking keeps it going yeah we get anxious then we get anxious about the fact we're feeling anxious then we're getting scared of the fact we're feeling it and it's just da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all, it's all, but you know, just to know that the mind is a tool and, and it's a puppy, but to know that we are not that we yes. can access a place beyond yeah. minds yeah, yeah, yeah. where we can, you know, decide what we think, think on purpose, mm -hmm. choose thoughts that serve us and just allow the, the mind <laughs> to do <laughs> what it does best, which is think mm -hmm. and not, not get upset or, or angry yeah. at it. Yeah, 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 exactly that. You know, thinking is spontaneous, it's random, it's going to do what it needs to do. But we, we are, I guess, before we call it ego thought, we take our ego thought out of it and we come more into our true sense of self. We kind of, we kind of blend into the oneness of life. We can just see it for what it is. And we, get, we see it with perspective and we see it with clarity. Yeah. We even use the phrase, don't we? The next day we think, oh, what was I thinking? We even use the phrase, what was I thinking? That's true. It was all thought. It's all thought. Mm. I, I want to go back because I was so, I really resonated with that imagery of the two patches of garden, mm. the full and then the, the barren. And mm. at, at the beginning you said, I'm the barren, you know, mm. and what you made that mean. And then, mm. then when you went back and you saw it, you said, I'm the barren or not, I'm the barren, but I'm the empty yeah. and what you made that mean. Yeah. And so I, that is so, that resonates with me so much because so often we can just allow ourselves to get so busy 
just so busy in life. How did you not only change the thoughts, but how did you go about making more space in not only in your mind, but also in your life um, to see that, to have that yeah. shift? I think it's that it's the fact it's seeing it in that way. It's about having a realization. I had an insight. I had a spiritual awakening insight. And it's about when you have an insight, you don't have to apply it. It's there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to remind yourself of it. It's just that you you suddenly, from the moment of being an insight, you see the world differently. I guess guess my job is to help my clients have more insights. Because then the change comes within them. They see it. It's like having a friend or acquaintance. You think you know and trust them. Then you find out something different about them. You have a change of heart. You have to remind yourself to apply that change of heart. You just have a different relationship with them from that moment. You probably used to believe in all sorts of things over the years as a child. You maybe believed in Father Christmas or, or the Tooth Day. At some point, you had a change of heart about them. You have to remind yourself mm-hmm. to hold that new thinking. It just had a change of heart. And when we have changes of hearts or an insight, life just changes more naturally because we see ourselves in life differently. Mm-hmm. So I had this kind of insight that, I was living life, I say, outside in, I'd be happy when. I didn't need to do that anymore. I had an insight of realizing we tend to regret the things we don't do and the things we do do. And I had this kind of realization. I didn't want to be on my kind of deathbed and regretting all the things I you know, played it safe and didn't kind of go on a journey of finding who I was. And, and, and I guess I got braver. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I could resign from this. It was a very good job, big company, good career, good pension, et cetera. I realized I could resign from that and go on this journey. It felt scary because my, not only my security was in my job. My identity was tied up to my yeah. job. It felt really scary, but it just felt the right thing to do. I guess over the years I've learned that the difference between our thinking and our, what I call your wisdom, your instincts, following your soul, following your wisdom doesn't always feel good. I think as humans, our thinking is, is addicted to feeling comfortable. But mm-hmm. sometimes our soul is calling us to go out of our comfort zone. And I just knew it felt right. It doesn't always feel good, but it feels right. Yeah. And it just yeah. felt really right. I just needed to go on this journey. So I resigned from this job. And so my wife was pregnant, you know, three or four months later. And I still actually still hadn't left the company. I gave them a six months notice because mm-hmm. I thought I needed six months to, to work out what to do next. And of course, they said, oh, you want to stay now? You've got a family on the way. You want to stay in this safe job? And I said, no, I think it happened in that order for a reason. I'm going to honor that. So guess what helped me reframe it was just realizing that I could trust my soul and knowing that if I can trust that. It felt scary. Yeah. Again, I became more aware of the fear was coming from. The fear was my think. The fear wasn't telling me anything about my life. It was just thought, what was the worst thing that could happen? Maybe I go get a similar job elsewhere. I have to go back to get another safe job. But I felt I had to go on this journey to explore who I was more and come from that place of just being more me. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Another thing about that is that we, having that, coming from that place, so you take more inspired action. For me, it's like a river. It stems the flow of fear and anxiety. And we do all sorts of things to try and improve our fertility. Now, I'm, I'm a cognitive hemotherapist, and I do a lot of hypnosis for clients, but I think visualizations, hypnosis, all that stuff is far more powerful and effective when you have a quieter mind. We stem that mm. tide of fear and anxiety and busy mind all those mind-body things we can do become far more effective. I guess that we get more clarity and perspective out what our soul is calling us to do for our own journey, whatever that journey may be. For me, it was that point, it was finding a new career, or whether it's having a baby. We just get more aligned to what's right for us. Yeah. And taking all the advice, taking what people say, but then just distill it through your soul, and your soul knows what's best for you. And learning to, to discern between as you say the thoughts and the um, and the heart the soul yeah. as you want yeah, to call yeah. it yeah yeah um i love what you said you know that it, it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel good to the mind because the mind's like no are you kidding <laughs> are you gonna like it will tell you all of these things to quote unquote protect you and keep you yeah. comfortable and keep you safe because that's what it knows yeah but um but somewhere inside of you you know that yeah you can't stay where you are if yeah. your soul is calling you to yeah. do something different. Yeah. You need to yeah. follow that. Yeah. It's a still soft voice within us. And this can be a brass band in a head that drowns it out. But the more attuned we come to it, you can hear it even as a brass band. You come more discerning between the two. And that still soft voice, when you hear it in moments of quiet, 
it's very soft, but it's very clear when you hear it. And it's always kind. It's always kind. You say, but sometimes it doesn't feel good. Yeah. But it feels right. It just feels right. How do hey, you know hey. to discern? Okay. How does it show up for you? Or is there a, a way that you can discern the soul from the, the mind? I think it's different for different people. I help people to just understand how they experience it in their body. It's more in our body. Most people, they're thinking, their fears in their head. Yeah, you might create a, a sensation of fear in your body, but often the causes the roots in its head mm-hmm. or the chest. Or For me, my, my soul, my wisdom is in my, be- my gut, my belly. Sometimes I put my hand down there and breathe into that space. Saying, okay, what does my wisdom say about this? Yeah, it's a, it's a softer, more gentle, but it's there. It's yeah. always there. And, yeah, sometimes we, we fall into the habit of getting caught into our thinking, but the more we discern, we, we catch ourselves, we can wake up from the spell. Thinking it allures us into this la-la land because it thinks it's trying to help us. It really believes it's helping us, but it's just looking in the wrong place for the answer. It's looking for well-being and happiness in this physical world. And the more, and it's got the best kind of special effects department in the world. It's got our emotions, you know, it's got our feelings. But the more we understand the difference, we catch ourselves, we wake up from the trance of thought, and we can see things more greater in clarity and perspective. And then we can feel what does our soul say about this. Sometimes we don't know what the answer is. We haven't heard our wisdom, but our wisdom is, is comfortable with that. Our wisdom, our soul, our true sense of self is more comfortable of not knowing. Our thinking hates not knowing. It wants to know we're going to be okay. But our wisdom, our soul knows we're going to be okay whatever happens. Yeah. It's, it's okay we're not knowing yet. And it's going to yeah. trust that it will, clarity will come. So sometimes I just don't know. But I set the intent. I want to get clarity on this situation. I just leave it. Just leave it. I might go for a walk or just leave it and come back to it. And it just comes in those moments of quiet. You know, people say, oh, I when they get their best answers to problems, the best solutions, the best ideas. It's not when they're thinking about the problems. It's when they're in the shower or walking the dog or mm-hmm. driving. It's when we got that space, new creativity, new ideas, and the fresh thinking come in. That's that for me. That's that's wisdom. That's intuition. Mm-hmm. And you know, and just to add on, you know, your soul, the, that wisdom that you speak of, it doesn't know time. No, it doesn't know time. It do, no. it doesn't. You know, the the ten years it, it loves. It says, oh, it took ten years. Yeah, time's a man and construct. It's so happy time. to experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time is it's an interesting subject because, yeah, it's just a, it's a man made construct. It's, you know, the past doesn't exist, the future doesn't exist. The only moment that exists is this present moment. We get so hung up. We, you know, work with my clients. Sometimes I get to list it, their, their kind of spatial awareness of time. Often it's a line. The future's ahead of them, the past is behind them. Mm-hmm. And we think life is this kind of series of, of, of stuff. Stuff, situations, <laughs> ideal, situations. You have uh, fires to put out of, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I know you guys in the States, so the bumper stickers are more common in the States than the UK, but there's the famous bumper sticker, and life's a bitch and then you die. You know, <laughs> I've never heard that one. <laughs> okay, yeah, the author of that bumper sticker clearly thinks life is a series of ordeals and then you get to death actually if life was that then death might be a good thing you know but yeah. <laughs> it's just a man-made construct you know the only moment that exists is the present moment yeah. and when we're in it we've got what we need yeah. our human operating system is resourced to, to live in the present moment yeah but the mind says how yeah let me focus harder on on i don't know a dot on the wall or something to, <laughs> or yeah, yeah. it tries to do so many things but yeah. um just yeah. allowing yeah that's just, just this present yeah and and, and say and, and not being hard on yourself when you catch yourself going into kind of that la 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 and the outside in thinking or the fearful thinking because it's just a habit we can't control it's like a weather system we can't control it and it started as a child and we could do some therapy work to understand that unpack that and do all that but the, as long as you understand it's just a habit and it's like we're wearing glasses we're looking at life through these glasses the moment we realize we're looking at life through the glasses, then our experience can change. We realize we're not experiencing life, we're experiencing the lens we're looking through. Mm-hmm. Just that understanding itself can shift our, our experience. We realize we don't need to fix everything. It's just mm-hmm. thinking this moment, it will clear. And seeing things clearly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. 
I feel bad. I haven't looked at all at your talking points. <laughs> I <wanted to> do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I loved our conversations. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add or talk about hypnotherapy or anything else that you wanted to talk about? We could touch on hypno hypnotherapy. I think um, hypnosis is quite a misunderstood subject in many ways. And stage hypnotists give this act of, or this air of being in control of their subjects. And it's a stage act. They've, they are hypnotized, but stage hypnotists are very adept at choosing the right subjects, extroverts. And the 10% of the population are more suggestible. Those events are normally fueled by alcohol, so inhibitions are down. So people out there are very happy to dance around like chickens or whatever they're doing. But that's not hypnosis in the purest form. That's not hypnotherapy. Chance is a very natural state. We all go into chance many times a day. That thinking, that la-la land thinking, mm. it takes us into a trance. Mm. Those times you might be reading a book or watching a TV program, you're not aware someone's trying to get your attention. You're zoned out. You're in a state mm. of trance. Or daydreaming chance, or something. Or daydreaming, yeah. Chance is a very natural state. And what hemotherapist does is just utilize that state mm -hmm. to access the unconscious mind. So it's a very natural, safe kind of a process. Mm -hmm. And everyone has a different experience of what it means to be in a trance. And I believe you don't need a deep state of trance to get quite a significant change. So I do use hypnosis with my clients alongside conversational coaching. And I think sometimes the hypnosis can help clear some of the beliefs and the thoughts from the past that are holding us back. Some of those thought habits mm -hmm. take the power out of them so we're less kind of, kind of railroaded by them. So, and, and it's a way of accessing the unconscious mind. You know, whether we like it or not, our mind is affecting our body. So why not harness that for, for positivity and to guide your unconscious mind to help you to do what you want to do because your unconscious mind controls all your bodily fu functions. And sometimes there's a little helping hand and giving you a little guidance to help it do what you want it to do. Mm. Is there a need to consciously know, you know, like what, whatever comes up during a session, during a hypnotherapy session, um, does it clear just by you going through the process or is there a need to consciously know what was uncovered? You don't have to consciously know what was uncovered. Some, some clients are more conscious aware of it, some aren't. They just feel the shift. You know, their souls learn something, their unconscious minds learn something. So everyone's experience is different. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, what I do though is with my clients, I record a hypnosis track based on our sessions. So they can repeat, they can listen to it at night. So it just reinforces those kind of changes. But they can fall asleep to it because I'm talking to their unconscious minds, not their conscious mind. Well, even actually, as I say that, even my conversational coaching, I'm talking to their soul, their unconscious mind. The conversation is pointing them back to their true sense of self, not our thinking self. And for me, that's where an insight comes from. Mm -hmm. The insight comes from within us when we hear something differently from in our soul and our conscious mind. And sometimes a client might get an insight, but not really aware of what the content of the insight is. They just feel different. They just feel it feels good. It feels positive. As if their soul has heard something, but they don't know exactly what it is. But they don't need to know what it is. They don't need to know what it is. Because when change comes at that deeper level, it becomes more natural, it becomes more effortless. It's not something you apply. It's just an understanding you start living from. Do you have any client testimonials or you know, I guess what, what people have said um, that you've worked with through hypnosis? Yeah, I think um, the, 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 the specific quotes, but I think one of the, the biggest thing that comes to people from clients is they weren't aware they had this potential within them, this really power to affect their biology so significantly because a lot of clients come to me and said oh, i'm not sure i can be hypnotized well everyone can be hypnotized it's just find the right way we, we have a different mind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why some of the genetic sometimes generic hypnosis is not so powerful because it, that's what it is generic and not everyone relaxes in the same way not everyone finds walking on the beach relaxing you know so it's working with the clients model of the world and or how their thinking mm -hmm. works everyone can be hypnotized i think the biggest thing is they realize how effortless that change was and they got significant kind of biological changes, but also psychological changes, mm -hmm. just by listening to a hypnosis track, just by mm -hmm. being guided by their unconscious mind, by imagination. I do a lot of kind of visualization work with clients, use their imagination, and it just feels effortless. It doesn't have to be hard work. Change doesn't have to be hard work. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, they realize they're this massive resource within them that they, they, they don't believe they can tap into. Maybe for some people that I'm just thinking some people that may be skeptical about it and they're, you know, and that's how I was very, you know, in my past life in this life, um, very skeptical about things I couldn't see or structures or 
yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. things I could couldn't touch or feel. Yeah. yeah. Um, how can tapping into the hypnosis and subconscious make a tangible difference in biology or a t- yeah I, I mean I've worked with clients who don't ovulate who have endometriosis who have <laughs> recurrent miscarriages all sorts of physical mm-hmm. things that can hold them back from getting pregnant and it's amazing to see the biological changes because the mind and body are one system the mind mm-hmm. and the body affects the mind so it's always amazing for them to to go through that journey and really see these these not just they feel different, they feel more resilient, they feel, but the, just the biological changes. Now, one of my first ever fertility clients, she'd gone through three rounds of IVF and she was rushing to get into the fourth round because she was approaching 40 with this kind of mindset that our fertility, fertility drops like a brick, a brick on our 40th birthday. <laughs> I love that imagery though. <laughs> yeah, and she had that unspoken pressure from friends and family to, 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 to crack on. But she wasn't ready to crack on. She needed just to just to take a break and just to re, to regroup. And so we did some work just to just to help her be more okay, just be more, I guess, resourced psychologically and physically. And I taught her some some hypnosis things and visualizations. And and she went into the fourth round of IVF and she harvested a much much higher number of good quality eggs and egg collection than the previous IVF. And she's convinced it was down to, she created these visualizations in her own head. I don't tell people what to visualize. I create a framework mm-hmm. for their unconscious mind to fill the gaps in because everyone has different imagery. It's just how your mind works. And if it comes from within you, it's far more potent, it's far more powerful. And she visualized different, different colored dots. It goes back to a conversation one of her uh, consultants she had once who's explained the process and used different colored dots to, to represent good quality eggs and poor quality eggs. And she just visualized more good quality eggs, green dots versus red dots. And she did that over and over. And lo and behold, she harvested a not much high number of good quality eggs. Was it just that hypnosis? Who knows? Who cares? She doesn't care. She just finally believes it was a massive role in her journey. And she felt more, I guess, more empowered in the journey as well. Because often we feel we, we, don't, we can't do anything about our fertility. Uh, and there's things we can do, not everything. So it's, it's, it's a mystery as well as a, a science. But realizing we have more, we have this mind body link and we can start to harness it can be really empowering. Beautiful. Well, I could talk to you forever. <laughs> but I want to be respectful of your time as well. And I know yeah, you have a welcome. fantastic uh, free gift for us. And so I would love for you to share, share that. Yeah, sure. I've got a, a bundle of kind of things to help people dive into this space in, in, in more depth because, yeah, we could talk about this. For, I could talk about this for hours. And the more you dive into it, the more depth you can and the more power you can get from it. So I've got a, a, an ebook, you know, three strategies for taking charge of your fertility, where we talk about the more the mind body link, the power of visualization, how to visualize and stuff like that. I've got a, an hour's, I think it's over an hour's kind of seminar recording where I can go into this more detail and they can listen to more about how what creates our experience, their relationship with thought, to help them, you know, find more of their innate well-being and just bypass this kind of habitual thinking. And I've got a sample hypnosis track so people can experience it for themselves in the comfort of their own home. They can listen to a, a fertility hypnosis track and just get that first-hand experience of what it can be like. Beautiful. Awesome. And we're going to have that, the link and everything on, on the speaker page that features Russell's interview. So thank you so much, Russell, for your time, for your really, you know, we are living in a, in an age of so much information, but I hear wisdom from you. I hear a lot of wisdom and space and sensitivity and, and a power that, that comes from this lived experience in both having gone through the journey and then also through that spiritual awakening. Mm-hmm. And I just, um, so honor you and acknowledge you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor.